the Florida Department of Transportation, Florida's Turnpike Enterprise, welcomes you to the Alternatives Public Information Meeting for the Turnpike Widening from South of I-595 to Walls Road Project Development and Environment, or PD&E study. This meeting will give interested persons an opportunity to review the project alternatives being considered, ask questions, and provide comments concerning the conceptual design and potential social, economic, and environmental effects of the proposed improvements. We appreciate your interest in this study. This meeting will begin with introductions of the study team members participating in tonight's virtual meeting. We will then show a project inf informational video, sorry, that runs for approximately 20 minutes. After which, we'll have a question and answer session and then close this virtual public meeting. My name is Jasmine Haywood. I am the Turnpike Project Manager. Lisa Stone, representing the consultant team, will assist me with the question and answer session. At this time, I would like to recognize elected and appointed officials who registered to attend this virtual public meeting. These include City of Lauderdale Lakes Commissioner Beverly Williams, City of Lauderdale Hill Commissioner Lawrence Martin, City of Deerfield Beach Commissioner Todd Drosky, Jason Nunemaker, Chief Administrative Officer, City of Plantation, City of, sorry, State Representative Christine Hunchowski, City of Coconut Creek Commissioner Sandra Welch, Town of Davie Vice Mayor Michelle Whitman, Maskud, Matsud Mohammed, Director of Engineering Services, City of Lauderdale Lakes, City of Coconut Creek Vice Mayor Joshua Rydell, Osama El Shami, Director of Utilities and Engineering, City of Coconut Creek, City of Coconut Creek Mayor Rebecca Tooley, Carol Morris, Assistant City Administrator of City of Plantation, and we also have City of Coconut Creek Commissioner Jackie Raley. Welcome to everyone, to all participants. The project presentation will now be shown. Florida Department of Transportation, Florida's Turnpike Enterprise, welcomes you to the Alternatives Public Information Meeting for the Project Development and Environment, or PD&E, study of the Turnpike Main Line widening from south of I-595 to Wiles Road in Broward County. This project is being developed in accordance with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, Public participation is solicited without regard to race, color, national origin, age, sex, religion, disability, or family status. Please contact one of the Title VI coordinators shown here to express any concerns regarding Turnpike's compliance with Title VI. This meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format to provide multiple opportunities for the public to receive information and provide input. This approach provides virtual, telephone, and face-to-face -face participation options. This is the outline for tonight's presentation. The purpose of this meeting is to provide you with an overview of the study, including information on the PD&E process, project needs, project alternatives, our public outreach efforts, and the study schedule. A PD&E study is the second phase of FDOT's transportation project development process. Key components of a PD&E study include an evaluation of existing conditions, identification of future traffic needs, development and evaluation of project alternatives, and public and agency involvement. All findings and recommendations are documented at the end of the study. If a build alternative is selected, then the project moves forward into the design phase. The study limits extend along Florida's Turnpike from south of I-595 at milepost 53 to Wiles Road at milepost 70. The project is located within Brower County. There are six existing interchanges within the study limits. The purpose and need for a project provides the basis for developing, considering, evaluating, and eliminating project alternatives. The project purpose and need 
are to enhance safety, accommodate year 2045 travel demand, improve travel time reliability, improve regional connectivity, and enhance emergency response and evacuation. Improvements to Florida's Turnpike are needed to enhance safety. Between 2012 and 2016, there were almost 3,000 crashes within the study limits, equating to an economic cost of $339 million. If nothing is done, increased congestion will lead to an increase in crashes. Improvements to Florida's Turnpike are needed to accommodate year 2045 travel demands. In 1960, Regional population was just under 1.5 million people, and it grew to over 6 million people by 2019. Regional population is forecasted to be just over 7.5 million people by the year 2045. Travel demands on the transportation network will increase as the population grows. In order to accommodate travel demand, eight lanes are needed now, from south of Atlantic Boulevard to Wiles Road and 10 lanes will be needed within this segment by 2040. 10 lanes will be needed from south of I-595 to south of Atlantic Boulevard by 2025, and 10 plus lanes by 2040. These travel demands must be met to provide a safe travel environment for all road users. Improvements to Florida's Turnpike are needed to improve travel time reliability. Currently, there is moderate to severe congestion during the morning and afternoon rush hours along the turnpike and at interchange ramps. It should be noted that Florida's turnpike did experience a drop in congestion during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, we are seeing congestion return to nearly pre-pandemic levels. If nothing is done, there will be more stop and go traffic, longer delays, and more crashes. The last two project needs include improving regional connectivity, and enhancing emergency evacuation. If the turnpike is not widened to accommodate travel demand, severe congestion will impact the movement of people and goods throughout the South Florida region. The improvements are also needed to efficiently process large volumes of traffic during emergency evacuation events. Based on the project needs, project alternatives were developed to widen the main line to 10 lanes with consideration for managed lanes provide continuous auxiliary lanes between interchanges, and improve the existing interchanges. Also, two new interchanges are being evaluated to relieve the existing interchanges. A full interchange at Oakland Park Boulevard and a partial interchange at Cypress Creek Road, McNabb Road. Florida Gas Transmission, or FGT, is a major utility with an existing state right-of-way that constrains the project alternatives. From I-595 to Atlantic Boulevard, there is one gas line located on the east side of the turnpike near the right-of-way line. From Atlantic Boulevard to Wiles Road, there are two gas lines located on the east side of the turnpike, further away from the right-of-way line. In 2013, FDOT and FGT entered into a legal agreement that covered the entire turnpike system. The agreement, in part, defined a specified width on either side of the gas lines. From I-595 to Atlantic Boulevard, there is one gas line, and the FGT specified width is 33 feet. From Atlantic Boulevard to Wiles Road, there are two gas lines, and the specified width is 60 feet. In this section, the FGT specified width spans the northbound paved shoulder. After 2013, certain turnpike improvements within the specified width would trigger the need for FGT to relocate the gas lines to the nearest practical location outside FDOT's right-of-way. Widening the turnpike into the specified width is an improvement that would trigger the need to relocate the gas lines. We will now present the project alternatives, starting first with the proposed mainline widening alternatives. From south of I-595 to south of Atlantic Boulevard, we are presenting one project alternative. In this segment, the FGT gas line is near the right-of-way line to the east, allowing for a center widening or widening to the outside in both directions. Four travel lanes, a managed lane, and an auxiliary lane will be provided in each direction. There is a potential for right-of-way impacts or potential need for additional land for the main line improvements from south of I-595 to south of Atlantic Boulevard. 
This aerial, which is oriented with north to the right, shows the proposed turnpike widening at Brower Boulevard. The yellow shading shows areas of potential right-of-way impacts, which are limited to the west side of the turnpike just north of Brower Boulevard. From south of Atlantic Boulevard to Wiles Road, we are presenting three project alternatives in response to community feedback. One that widens the turnpike to the west with an existing right-of-way, another that widens the turnpike on a center alignment, and a third that widens the turnpike to the east. All three alternatives would provide the same number of lanes. The Florida gas transmission specified width is a major constraint within this roadway segment. As previously noted, from Atlantic Boulevard to Wiles Road, there are two gas lines. The specified width is 60 feet, and it spans the northbound paved shoulder. There is enough area within the existing state right-of-way on the west side to widen to the required number of lanes without impacting the FGT specified width. While this approach would be the most feasible, we are also presenting alternatives that widen into the FGT specified width, triggering the need to relocate the lines to compare costs and impacts. A clear, unobstructed right-of-way width of 60 feet would be needed for the relocated gas lines. Acquiring 60 feet of additional right-of-way would be very impactful to surrounding communities and very costly. From south of Atlantic Boulevard to Wiles Road, the first project alternative would widen the turnpike to the west, staying within the existing right-of-way to provide four travel lanes and a managed lane in each direction. From south of Atlantic Boulevard to Wiles Road, the second project alternative would widen the turnpike on a center alignment or to the outside in both directions to provide four travel lanes and a managed lane in each direction. This alternative will require relocation of the FGT gas lines to the nearest practical location outside the FDOT right-of-way. Please note that this study assumes that the FGT gas lines would be relocated just outside the existing state right-of-way on the east side. FGT makes the final determination on the new gas line location. From south of Atlantic Boulevard to Wiles Road, the third and final project alternative would widen the turnpike to the east to provide four travel lanes and a managed lane in each direction. This alternative will also require relocation of the FGT gas lines to the nearest practical location outside the FDOT right-of-way. Please note that this study assumes that the FGT gas lines would be relocated just outside of the existing state right-of-way on the east side. FGT makes the final determination on the new gas line location. An evaluation matrix compares the potential costs and impacts of widening to the west, widening on a center alignment, and widening to the east from South Atlantic Boulevard to Wiles Road. The noise impacts would be comparable in all three options after mitigating with noise barriers. The number of residential and commercial relocations are major in the center and east widening, while shifting the turnpike mainline to the west would require no relocations. Center widening and shifting to the east would add substantial costs to relocate the gas lines and purchase an additional 60 feet of right-of-way to accommodate the relocated lines. The construction costs for all three options are very similar, and are shown as equal in this matrix. Based on the categories considered in the evaluation matrix, the estimated cost to widen Florida's turnpike with an existing right-of-way by shifting to the west is $129 million. The estimated cost to widen the turnpike on the center alignment is almost $500 million higher at $625 million. The estimated cost to widen the turnpike by shifting to the east is the costliest at about $650 million. The comparison of costs and impacts show that widening to the west with an existing state right-of-way will have the least impacts and lowest cost. The study is also evaluating improvements to six existing interchanges and the potential for two new interchanges at Oakland Park Boulevard and Cypress Creek Road, McNabb Road. Exhibits have been prepared that show the proposed interchange improvements in detail. Included on each exhibit is an evaluation matrix that compares the alternatives for each interchange location. These exhibits are available on the project website www.turnpike595to-wiles.com and will be on display at the in-person meeting.
This presentation provides an overview of the proposed improvements at each interchange. At the I-595 interchange, improvements are needed to accommodate a new southbound lane drop. Alternative 1 accomplishes this by restriping a portion of the existing southbound roadway, while Alternative 2 constructs a new southbound off-ramp. The yellow shading in Alternative 2 shows areas of potential right-of-way impacts or potential need for additional land. Alternative 1 provides the same traffic benefits as Alternative 2 with lower impacts and cost. At Sunrise Boulevard, there is one build alternative. The existing ramp bridge will be reconstructed to accommodate turnpike widening. Additionally, the eastbound right turn lane on Sunrise Boulevard will be extended to State Road 7. The yellow shading shows areas of potential right-of-way impacts. We are presenting one alternative to construct a new interchange at Oakland Park Boulevard. This full interchange would provide all movements to and from Florida's Turnpike. The interchange ramps would connect directly to a realigned Rock Island Road, and the existing Rock Island Road and Oakland Park Boulevard intersection will be reconfigured. The existing overpass bridge would need to be reconstructed to accommodate Turnpike widening, and Northwest 52nd Avenue would need to be realigned. The yellow shading shows areas of potential right-of-way impacts. Shown in this photo is the existing Oakland Park Boulevard crossing at the Turnpike, looking north to northwest. And this is what the potential Oakland Park Boulevard interchange could look like after construction. There are two alternatives to improve the existing commercial boulevard interchange. Alternative 1 reconstructs the overpass and ramp bridges to accommodate turnpike widening. Alternative 2 eliminates the existing trumpet-style interchange configuration and constructs a new ramp intersection for the southbound on and off movements on the west side of Florida's turnpike. The yellow shading shows areas of potential right-of-way impacts. Although it has higher construction costs and right-of-way impacts, Alternative 2 results in better traffic operations at the interchange. In both of the commercial boulevard alternatives, modifications are required to the existing southbound on-ramp. The yellow shading shows areas of potential right-of-way impacts just south of commercial boulevard on the west side. We are presenting one alternative to construct a new interchange at Cypress Creek Road, McNabb Road. This partial interchange would provide southbound off and northbound on access with Florida's turnpike. New ramp intersections would be constructed. The existing overpass bridge would need to be replaced to accommodate turnpike widening. The yellow shading shows areas of potential right-of-way impacts. Shown in this photo is the existing Cypress Creek Road crossing at the turnpike looking northeast. And this is what the potential Cypress Creek Road interchange could look like after construction. There are two alternatives to improve the existing Atlantic Boulevard interchange. Alternative 1 maintains the existing partial interchange but widens the northbound off-ramp. The existing right turn lane for eastbound Atlantic Boulevard onto the southbound turnpike on-ramp is also widened to provide signalized double right turn lanes. Alternative 2 includes the improvements of Alternative 1 and adds the missing movements to create a full interchange adding a southbound off-ramp and a northbound on-ramp. The yellow shading shows areas of potential right-of-way impacts. Alternative 1 has better traffic operations and is less costly, while Alternative 2 improves turnpike accessibility. There are two alternatives to improve the existing Coconut Creek Parkway interchange. Both alternatives replace the overpass and ramp bridges to accommodate turnpike widening. Also, common to both alternatives is new ramps to and from the south, a realigned southbound off-ramp, and a Blount Road interchange connector to provide direct access to the interchange ramps from Blount Road. The yellow shading shows areas of potential right-of-way impacts. The existing southbound on-ramp at the Coconut Creek Parkway interchange is highlighted in green 
and is adjacent to the Winmore Village. Both alternatives relocate the southbound on-ramp to the southwest quadrant of the interchange. The existing southbound off-ramp is highlighted in blue. Both alternatives realign this loop ramp, pulling it away from the building 1601 and 1605 in Winmore Village. Next, we'll discuss how the Coconut Creek Parkway interchange alternatives differ. Alternative 1 includes a stop-controlled intersection at the Blount Road connector. It removes the right turn from Coconut Creek Parkway onto Blount Road, instead routing northbound Blount Road traffic through the ramp terminal intersection. Alternative 2 introduces a roundabout and continues to provide northbound Blount Road access directly off Coconut Creek Parkway. The improvements proposed in Alternative 1 present a greater modification to the existing traffic patterns with the relocation of the northbound Blount Road right turn access. At Sample Road, there is one interchange alternative. It eliminates the existing trumpet-style configuration and constructs a new ramp intersection for the southbound on and off movements on the west side of Florida's Turnpike. This requires the realignment of the Trade Winds Park access road. The overpass bridges will be reconstructed to accommodate the realigned access road and the turnpike widening. The yellow shading shows areas of potential right-of-way impacts. The no-build alternative will also be considered. This alternative examines what happens if the mainline widening or interchange improvements are not built. Advantages include no impacts to the social, physical, or natural environment and no additional right-of-way or construction costs. Disadvantages include increased congestion and safety issues, slower emergency evacuation and response times, and future growth in the study area would not be accommodated. This concludes the presentation of the project alternatives. We encourage you to visit the project website to view detailed exhibits of the proposed improvements. Your questions and comments will be accepted at any time throughout the study. As part of the study, the selected project alternative will be evaluated in detail to analyze potential effects to the social, cultural, natural, and physical environment in accordance with state and federal regulations. A noise evaluation will be performed to identify locations where noise barriers are potentially reasonable and feasible. These locations will be shown at the public hearing and further evaluated during the project's design phase. Public involvement is a very important part of the PD&E study process. We continue to use various outreach methods to solicit local agency and public input on this important project. Florida's Turnpike Enterprise will continue to coordinate with local agencies located within the project limits. The study team is also coordinating with other Turnpike projects to the north and south of the study limits. After tonight's meeting, we will review public comments in conjunction with the social, cultural, environmental, and engineering factors to reach a recommendation on a preferred alternative. The preferred alternative will then be presented to the public for input in the summer of 2022, with the project ending in the end of 2022. Please note that the schedule is subject to change. Your input is essential to the PD&E process. You can submit written comments at the project website www.turnpike595towiles.com. If you attend in person at the Signature Grand, you can complete a printed comment form. You can also email the project manager directly or submit your comments by U.S. mail to the project manager. While written comments and questions are accepted at any time, we ask that you provide comments that you may have in connection with this public meeting by January 31, 2022. Thank you for your interest in the turnpike widening from south of I-595 to Wiles Road, PD&E study. And thank you for taking the time to participate in this meeting. Thank you for your attention to the project video. We hope it was informative. 
We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to submit a question and are using a desktop computer or um, open the GoToWebinar control panel by clicking the top arrow as shown and then enter your question into the question pane and hit send. We may not address all questions received tonight, but all questions submitted will become part of the public meeting record and will help inform the study process. If you are using a smartphone or tablet and are interested in submitting a question, you will open the question pane by clicking on the question mark in the top right, enter your question, and hit the arrow to submit. So Lisa is going to join me so that we can get this. Actually, Lisa, just wait one sec. Let's um, do okay. this first um, question. Thank you, Lisa. Um, one, one more forward, please. So we've received a number of questions related to how to find project information, including maps that show potential impacts to the adjacent property. So what we've done is we've prepared a very short video that shows you how to navigate the project website to get to those maps so that you can see if your uh, property is impacted or whatever question you may have. So we'll go ahead and play that short video right now. All of the meeting materials that will be on display at the Signature Grand are available for your review on the project website in the virtual exhibit room. To review the exhibits, click the Public Meeting Exhibit Room button located at the top of the page. The new page that opens will include a list of exhibits available for review. If you click on one of the tabs on the left, the exhibit board, along with a brief description, will open to allow you to zoom in and out. For example, the project location map is shown on this slide as an example of one of the display boards you can find on the project website. There are a total of 14 aerial maps on the project website for review. The first seven maps cover the entire study area. Next, there are boards for I-595, Oakland Park Boulevard, Commercial Boulevard, Cypress Creek Road, Atlantic Boulevard, Coconut Creek Parkway, and sample road that show all of the alternatives under consideration for that interchange and an evaluation matrix comparing the alternatives, including the no build option. The aerial maps show the existing features of the study area and the proposed improvements for each alternative. Each image has a legend which includes a sample of each symbol and a short description of what the symbol means. For example, blue on the aerial maps show where new bridges or widened bridges are proposed. Gray shows areas of proposed roadway improvements, green shows areas of proposed sod, and yellow shows the proposed limited access right-of-way needed for the project. All of the aerial maps are oriented with north pointing to the right. The north arrow and scale of each exhibit can be found in the upper right-hand corner. There are seven 200 scale corridor maps that when combined cover the entire study area. A key map of each aerial is shown for orientation. The corridor maps contain one alternative for each segment, and the alternative presented is labeled with a green callout. This is an example of what you will see on a commercial boulevard exhibit. The two build alternatives are shown next to each other. In the upper left-hand corner, you will see the name of the alternative. An evaluation matrix is included for each alternative, comparing the build and no build alternatives. Also included is a legend, which was previously explained. Following the meeting, a recording of the Virtual Alternatives Public Information Meeting will be made available on the project website. All right, so that the project information, you can either go to the public meeting exhibit room as, as the video explained, but all those same exhibits are also on the project website. If you scroll down to, what is it? Alternatives, public information meeting, all those um, exhibits are also um, stored there as well. So Lisa, thank you for joining me. Let's go ahead and get the um, um, kick off the uh, question and answer session with questions that we received before the meeting. So, okay. I want, want to thank all the participants who submitted questions before. I do want to take this time to acknowledge the numerous comments that we received from City of Coconut Creek residents. Thank you so much for your interest in the study. We hope that some of these questions do respond to some of your concerns. And let's go ahead, Lisa, and kick off the first one. 
Okay, so uh, is the widening a sudden proposal or has this been on the books a long time? Thank you. So widening from Atlantic Boulevard to, to the north has been around for nearly 20 years. A pd &E study was completed in 2006 with limits from Atlantic Boulevard to Hillsborough Boulevard. The recommendation of that study, Lisa, was to widen the turnpike to eight lanes on a center alignment, which again means widening to the outside in both directions. In 2013, that legal agreement that was mentioned in, in the video, um, FDOT and Florida Gas Transmission, or FGT, entered in, into a legal agreement, and that agreement defined roles and responsibilities for all future turnpike work, turnpike-wide, system-wide, that would impact the gas lines. The design phase for the turnpike widening from Atlantic Boulevard to Hillsborough started some years later, but was stopped in 2017. So the ongoing study, the one that we're discussing tonight, with limits from south of I-595 to Walls Road, will identify a feasible alternative to address the project needs, one of which is to accommodate 2045 traffic demand. It's important to note that the 2006 study looked at 2030 traffic demand, and because we're about 16 years later, we're now looking at 2045 traffic demand. Okay, the next uh, question is how many cities would be affected and would they all need to sign off on the changes? 11 cities are within the um, city limits, some more impacted than others, or some further away. All the 11 cities include, as shown in the map, city of, the cities of Plantation, Fort Lauderdale, Lauder Hill, Lauderdale Lakes, North Lauderdale, Tamarack, Margate, Coconut Creek, Pompano Beach, Darefield Beach and the town of Davie. We're also coordinating with other local agencies, including Broward County, the Broward MPO. As part of our outreach, we are coordinating with all these local agencies mentioned to receive feedback on the proposed improvements. Some local governments may choose to provide resolutions of support or non-support for or against the project. The department will consider all local agency feedback when determining whether the project moves forward. Okay, thanks, Jaslyn. The next one is, what would be required for this project to move forward, and do the residents vote on the project? Public input, local agency feedback, and the results of engineering and environmental evaluations are factors that the department will consider when determining whether the project moves forward or not. So a public vote is not conducted. Rather, public input is solicited through various means, including public meetings such as this. The final public meeting will be a public hearing um, coming up towards the end of this year or in the summer of this year, I think, and the project website. Okay, and will there be nighttime construction? Inevitably, yes, there will be nighttime construction. And this is to ensure the safety of the traveling public and construction workers. Um, simply put, traffic volumes are just much less at night, and these al this allows the lanes to be closed and the traffic to be maintained in a safe manner. So yes to nighttime construction, Lisa. Okay, um, we've gotten this question quite a bit. Will noise walls be built at my community? As men, um, the pd &E study will include a comprehensive noise analysis. So noise there are noise specialists will use federally and state approved methodology, and they will predict the future noise impacts and identify locations that potentially qualify for noise walls under state and federal regulations. The findings will be, be documented in a noise study report and locations that meet federal and FDOT criteria for noise walls in the PD &E study will be recommended for future study in the design phase. So the results of this study will be available for public review prior to the public hearing and locations where noise walls are, deemed, uh, are, are potentially feasible and reasonable. The, the graphics or the exhibits that we show at the public hearing, there will in the, in the, those locations will be noted on those graphics. So more to come on, on noise walls. Okay, and then what are the maximum noise wall heights that would be constructed? So, so the maximum allowable height of ground mounted noise walls, and these are the walls that are near the, uh, the right-of-way line, those are at 22 feet due to wind load. 
For noise walls now located near the edge of, a of the shoulder, the maximum allowable height is 14 feet if it's ground mounted and eight feet if it's located at the top of, of a wall or a bridge structure. And um, can the existing noise wall next to our community be moved or increased in height so it works better? So the pd e noise analysis will cover current conditions and that includes existing walls. If, the, um, if it is determined that there are still future noise impacts that exceed FDOT criteria, we will evaluate if new or taller walls can effectively meet the criteria. And mind you, this is still within the limits of FDOT design criteria. We just covered the maximum noise wall height. So that's really important to note. We can't go over 22 feet um, for the ground mounted at the right of way. So we cannot guarantee during pd &E that existing noise walls will be replaced or supplemented by better walls. If the study indicates that noise walls, better no, um, new or taller noise walls are um, potentially feasible and reasonable, these will be um, further studied in design. Okay, and can the noise walls be constructed first? This, this was a question that we got at a recent community meeting, and the answer is yes. For those noise walls that are to be constructed near the right-of-way line, the department actually considers it a best practice to construct them in the first phase of work. So this will be done typically within the first year of construction, but it will also be concurrent with other peripheral improvements. All right, and will trees be removed in front of my property? So currently there is a chain link fence on both sides of the turnpike that denote the existing state right of way limits. In the areas where there is no additional right of way needed, the landscaping outside the fence will remain. Landscaping within the fence, as shown in this picture, you might see some oak trees um, within the fence, within the turnpike right of way. Those will likely be impacted by construction. So the conceptual plans that we just pointed folks to, they show the existing and the proposed right of way lines. And again, those are available for review on the project website. All right, uh, why can't the gas lines in the area of Coconut Creek be moved so that the turnpike can be widened to the east? Moving the gas line so that the turnpike can be widened to the east in the area of Coconut Creek, so that's the northern end of the project from south of Atlantic Boulevard to Wiles Road, this will be more impactful and costly as shown in the evaluation matrix. A clear unobstructed right of way width of 60 feet would be needed for the relocated gas lines. On either side of the turnpike in this area, there isn't vacant land available to relocate the gas lines to. So we mentioned that we made assumptions, which was um, relocating the gas lines in the east side within the city of Pompano Beach. That could be incorrect, but those are the assumptions that we made in this study. The, the gas lines have to go somewhere. The most feasible alternative in the area of Coconut Creek is to stay within our existing right of way and widen turnpike to the needed number of lanes again, with an existing state right away. So to help visualize the potential impacts of relocating the gas lines, we're gonna use this graphic. So north is to the right, and we're between Atlantic Boulevard on the left and Coconut Creek Park, we're on the right. So Turnpike runs down the middle and shown as a proposed widening to 10 lanes within existing state right away. So, uh, this graphic hopefully shows, highlights the fact that development on both sides of Turnpike, whether you're talking about city of Coconut Creek or city of um, Pompano Beach, it's dense. They're consisting of homes, businesses, schools, and so on. So relocation of the gas lines outside state right away, either on the west side or the east side, could result in a relocation of a significant number of homes and businesses. So we're not just talking about cost, we're talking about social impacts as well. Now this graphic, north is still to the right, and we are now between Coconut Creek Park on the left and Copens Road on the right. Turnpike runs down the middle and shown as a proposed widening to 10 lanes within existing state right away. So again, hope, hopefully this graphic highlights the fact that development on both sides is dense. 
consisting of homes, businesses, and so on. So relocation of the gas lines outside of state right away, either on the east or the west side of Turnpike in City of Coconut Creek or City of Pompano Beach could result in significant impacts to both um, communities to a number of homes and, um, and business relocation. So again, just stressing that it's not just the cost factor involved. All right, are any improvements being made to the Coconut Creek Parkway interchange? Lights from cars on the ramp shine into my home at night. Okay, so we have received this comment from several Winmore residents and we went back to the drawing board to modify the existing interchange configuration at the Coconut Creek Parkway. Um, the loop ramp that exists today will be removed while maintaining full access. So we're not removing any access at the interchange. It's still going to be a full interchange at Coconut Creek Parkway. The southbound on-ramp will be moved to the southwest corner of the interchange and provide um, turnpike access from either direction in Coconut Creek. Whether you're traveling east or west in Coconut Creek, you'll be able to access that southbound on-ramp. Now the southbound off-ramp will be pulled closer to the turnpike. And I think the video before mentioned, was it 1601 and 1605, those buildings in Coconut Creek that experienced that headlight glare? We're hoping that that does a lot to, to alleviate that um, concern. All right, so it's still me, Lisa. So these pictures, again, illustrate that loop ramp removal. So the top picture shows the existing conditions at Coconut Creek Parkway, um, the existing southbound on and off loop ramp. And in the bottom graphic is a rendering at that same location showing the removal of the loop ramp. This reconfiguration again pulls traffic away from Winmore Village because the, the loop ramp is, is gone. And note the potential noise walls, which would be constructed in state right away. The dense landscaping along the border of Winmore Village is on Winmore property and will remain. Okay, um, will the will we be charged extra for using the managed lanes? The best part about true lanes, Lisa, or managed lanes is what we refer to them as in this in this project is that customers pay the same toll that they would pay to travel in all other lanes on the toll road. The toll is collected electronically with the SunPass or another interoperable transponder. These lanes offer to customers making longer, more regional trips the ability to bypass the local traffic entering and exiting the road. So the customers pay the same amount to use these managed lanes or true lanes as they do in any other lane on the toll road. Okay, if my business or residence is impacted, how will Turnpike FDOT compensate me for my financial loss? And will FDOT tell me where I must live or relocate? No, DOT will not. If, if there's a relocation, that DOT will not say where you must live. But we're quite a ways away from that. Um, that um, this coordination happens in design, and I think we're going to get to a question or, or I could say now the project, there's no funding for any future phases of this project. But at the end of the day, the question asks what, I'm uh, just gonna stick to the question. If someone's property is impacted, a member of our right away team will contact them again during final design. So we're still a little premature in that. The, it's shown here, uh, the gentleman's name is Chad Marcus, our right away project manager, phone number 407-264. 3385. Chad is going to be at the in-person location tomorrow. And even if you have questions in PDE, um, when you take a look at those project exhibits, and if you think, that, and if you see that your project, uh, sorry, your home or property is impacted, feel free to call Chad if you're not attending tomorrow, and he will answer your questions. All right. Um... The next question, if the plan proceeds as expected, how soon would we see construction start and see its completion? So there is no funding for the project beyond the current pd &E study phase. So therefore no timelines for right away, design or construction have been developed. So as we move through the project or study process, this may change, but at this current moment, there's no funding. 
All righty. So Lisa, thank you for helping me go through the questions that we previously received. I know um, hopefully you've had some time to pull some questions that we're getting in the chat box. So we're now going to respond to questions received during the virtual meeting. Just want to remind everyone there's, there's quite a, um, that we may not be able to answer all your questions tonight, but all questions will become part of the public meeting record and it would help inform the study process. So Lisa, I don't think I even have to ask if we receive any questions, because I know we did. We so did, get... we did. So um, someone would like to know um, why they cannot make a verbal comment tonight. But we want to it. hear from our participants. It's just that our public meetings, they are held in an open house format. Because of the pandemic, of course, we are offering um, interested persons the opportunity to still be engaged in the um, study process. Um, so again, thank you for your attendance. And again, everything that's going to be on display tomorrow night is going to be um, is on the website. So. Um, Hopefully that explains why you can't make a verbal comment, but you will be able to make a verbal comment behind a microphone with the court reporter at hand, and that's reserved for the public hearing. We're, we're thinking that we're gonna be able to hold a public hearing in the late summer of this year, so late summer 2022. But in the meantime, your comments still matter. Again, I mentioned we got quite a, quite a few, very, a lot. Um, from the Winmore Village residents. So please continue to send in your comments. Again, they're going to inform the study process and um, they will be reviewed by the study team. Okay, thanks, Jaslyn. Uh, the next one, we've had a couple regarding drainage. So if you could address drainage, um, but where will the water go? We already have drainage issues. All right, so the p study process includes pond site evaluations or evaluation of, um, of the needs for uh, to accommodate stormwater runoff and floodplain compensation. So during the pond sites will be evaluated and recommended um, to address needs for water quality and quantity in addition to floodplain compensation. There, the findings will be documented in a report and that report will be available available for public review prior to the hearing. I want to point out that all the documents that we prepared as part of this PD study, the noise study, now I just mentioned the drainage report, we call it a pond siding report. Those will all be, and there's quite a few more, they will all be available for public review on the project website at least 21 days prior to the public hearing. So hopefully I answer that question, Lisa. All right, thanks, Jaslyn. Um, you've talked about the hearing and we got a question about what we will actually be presenting at the public hearing and how will it be different from this meeting that we're holding? So at this meeting, we have presented different project alternatives, like there were two alternatives at the Commercial Boulevard and so on and so forth. So at the, and, and we also presented, of course, those three mainline alternatives from Atlantic Boulevard to Wiles Road. So in, we have different alternatives. At the public hearing, we're gonna have boiled this thing down to one alternative, one overall preferred project alternative, one to widen the main line from Fraud 95 to Atlantic, one alternative from, um, for the Northern section, one alternative for each interchange, and we're gonna package it up and provide it for a public input again. We still plan on providing a virtual participation option, but the good news um, is that I mentioned um, folks will be able to provide verbal comments at the hearing. When you attend virtually like you're doing tonight using GoToWebinar, at the public hearing, you'll be able to, we'll call your name at registration, you'll say you want to make a comment. There'll be a question saying, would you like to provide a comment? And then you, when you say yes, now we'll at the at the appropriate time we'll call your name, and then you will un, we'll unmute you, and you will be able to provide your comments. So you don't need to attend in person, behind the mic, to provide a comment. You the virtual participation option will will also um, allow you to provide your verbal comments. So I think that's going to be a good thing. I think folks will be happy to hear that. And it's all and part of, of the public record. 
Exactly, all part of the public yeah. record, but you do not need to show up in person to be able to voice your concerns verbally. Next one, Lisa. Okay, uh, the next question we've got is, will the public have a say in the process? Well, I hope my, my previous question just explained it, um, but I guess I have to go dig a bit dig a bit deeper. So all these comments, the team um, um, looks at them, identifies the major concerns and see how it can be addressed and mitigated if it has not already been addressed and mitigated. So public input is factored into the department's decision as to whether the project moves forward into design or not. So again, it's public input, local agency feedback, the results of engineering and environmental evaluations, all those factors determine whether are things that the department considers when determining whether to move this project forward. So I, yes, the project, the public does have a say in the process. Okay. Um, I'm going to kind of combine two into one for this next one. Um, so how long will the construction take? And also when will the new interchanges at Oakland Park Boulevard and Cypress Creek Road be built? All right, so again, because there is no funding for the project, we have not developed any timelines um, for any future phases, including construction. Um, the new interchanges at Oakland Park Boulevard and Cypress Creek Road that you mentioned, um, so there is no timeline for it, but I would like to say that once we start, the project is 17 miles, six interchanges, two new uh, potential. It's a big project. It's not going to go to construction in one one big chunk. It's going to have to be segmented or broken broken into smaller manageable pieces, not just manageable for the co contractor, but manageable for the traveling public. So it's going to be segmented. So there's a chance that those two new interchanges, because of the need, because they are looking to relieve the existing interchanges at, uh, what is it, Commercial Boulevard, and I forgot the other one, um, but because they are reliever interchanges, that they may be, be able to go first and some other segments of the mainline widening go next. So it's, it's just going to be pieced up and prioritized and funded. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jaslyn. Um, now, we've gotten questions regarding other areas, you know, being constructed. So really the one that, that hits, hits all of that is, are there any plans to widen the turnpike north and south of this project? All right, so I'm gonna try and remember our adjacent projects. There are several programmed and planned projects, whether they be in design or construction to the north and to the south. So to the south is an interim um, eight laning and to the north, so is it from Wiles to Boynton Beach? There's a 10 lane project. Um, so, so yes, the projects, there are projects to the north and south of these limits that will widen the turnpike. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, and I never see congestion on the turnpike. Where is the congestion? There is congestion. There's moderate to severe congestion. And these occur during the morning and afternoon um, rush hours along the turnpike and at the interchange ramp. So the, uh, the presentation showed like a crash heat map. And, um, and, that, and, and most, of, some, most of those crashes are rare end crashes and that a contributing factor is, is congestion. So we, the congestion is there. We would like to point out as in the video that the COVID, during the COVID pandemic, there was a, a drop in congestion but we are seeing congestion nearly return to pre-pandemic levels. So the congestion is there along the turnpike at the interchange ramps. And if nothing is done, there'll be more stop and go traffic, more um, longer delays and more crashes. Okay, thank you, Jaslyn. You addressed this earlier, but I'm still getting some questions regarding can noise walls be constructed first? Yes, that this is, this is an important, topic to a lot of folks out there. So let's go over it again. Those noise walls that are near the right-of-way line, so those 22-foot noise walls um, that are near the right-of-way line, the department considers it best practice. It's normal practice to construct them within the first phase of work, typically within the first year of construction. So, um, but mind you, it's concurrent with other peripheral improvements. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so I am concerned about the air pollution during and after construction. What can you say about this and also the dust? Okay. All right, thank you, Lisa. So one of the goals is of this study is to reduce congestion and decrease the air pollution by moving the vehicles through the area instead of having them sit in the congestion. Because as they as cars idle, they produce exhaust fumes that can worsen air quality. And slower moving vehicles emit more pollution than vehicles traveling at a higher speed. So I mentioned before that the APD study um, takes a time it take, takes time it takes about two years because we're we're making sure to look at all the environmental um, impacts and one of this um, one of these categories is air so an air quality screening will be performed as part of the study and what what it looks like what it looks at is future traffic we're looking at 2045 traffic so that screening will um, um, project out that future traffic to see if there are any changes to the air quality in the project area we follow the um, the the um, standards as set forth by the u.s environmental protection agency and the air quality technical memorandum will be available 21 days prior to the public hearing so um, I think you, the question also asked about um, during construction, right, Lisa? It did, yes. Oh, good, thanks. Yeah. So if the project gets to construction, which we, we're hoping because it's, it's sorely needed out there, the contractors will have to follow standard specifications for road and bridge construction. So this requires several activities. I'm sure folks have seen like water trucks, um, um, spraying water so that to, minim to mitigate the dust and debris on construction sites. That's just one such thing that will be done during construction to minimize um, air pollution during construction. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jaslyn. Um, more questions about the noise. Um, when will the noise study be available for review? I know you mentioned it, but maybe reiterate it. I think you can even answer it, Lisa. So it's 21 days prior to the public hearing. We will make, make sure everything is on the website. And it's not, you know what, good thing it's asked again, because it's not just at the website. We understand that everyone doesn't have access to, to um, the computer. So we will, we will also provide it a physical location, like a library which is what we normally use, a library location. And so where we don't know yet, but we will identify that location and it will be in our public hearing notifications, which also includes a newspaper ad. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question is, what impact will autonomous vehicles have on the need to widen the turnpike? Autonomous, I'm gonna try and say that right, autonomous vehicles. So impacts of autonomous vehicles and the need to widen turnpike will depend on the penetration right and I know that's a technical term so it simply means how many autonomous vehicles are on the road so let me let me use that moving forward so experts anticipate that um, when there are more than 50 percent autonomous vehicles on the road that it will free up highway capacity by 10 percent and this is when compared to existing capacity levels so those same experts project that it'll take beyond our design year for this study, beyond 2045, until there are 50% autonomous vehicles on the road. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the next question is, why can't we widen to eight lanes instead of 10 from north of Atlantic Boulevard to Wiles Road? Okay, so I mentioned before 2045 design year, that's that's the year that this study is looking out to projecting out to. And we're trying to, to we're identifying a project alternative that meets the needs of in the year 2045. So um, traffic forecasts from the Broward MPO planning model. So it's using a local model, planning model, shows that projected traffic volumes will warrant 10 lanes by 2040 to achieve acceptable operations on the turnpike. So it's it's simply based on need. Okay. All right, thank you um, for those clarifications. Jaslyn, I know it's a lot of information. I think people appreciated the answers. Um, we're getting a lot of questions in that are 
duplicates of what was already asked um, and some that require more detail. So if we haven't answered everyone's questions, we'll follow back up with you or we'll address it in another meeting. Um, but for now, Jasmine, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Well, thank you, Lisa, before you go for helping me um, facilitate this question and answer session. And as you said, we probably didn't cover everyone's questions tonight, but the good thing is please continue to send them in because we are hope what we will do as the project manager, what I do plan to do is um, make sure that if there's something that this presentation hasn't already addressed as we go through get ready for a public hearing, we make sure that we, if it, perhaps there's something we're just not explaining as well as we should, we'll make sure that we um, explain it better for our next presentation. So please just continue to submit your questions and comments. All right, so I think there's another slide I would like to remind everyone on to provide comments again for us. Can we go back the other way? All right, so yes, this is very important. So we're concluding the question and answer session. We'll review all comments and questions received. And this, the end of this virtual meeting does not mean that we're no longer accepting comments and questions. We look forward to folks who, are, who feel comfortable attending or interested persons who feel comfortable attending the in-person meeting tomorrow evening at the Signature Grand. We look forward to welcoming you and to answer your, your questions and that you may have. We're gonna have a fully staffed um, um, public meeting. It's gonna be open house, um, but we'll be there to, to discuss, to, to talk one-on-one, -on -one, answer your questions. If you, if you need any clarifications from tonight's meeting, we'll be there to do that. The uh, video of this meeting will be posted to the project website in about four days. I think by Monday it should be up on the project website. So we encourage you to provide, just continue to be engaged in this project. We really do appreciate the interest that you show. We understand the concerns that you, got, that, that you have. So as a reminder, I think I've already said that, um, thank you for your interest in this project. You can visit the project website. Please explore the virtual exhibit room to, um, to look at those um, exhibits and see uh, what we're proposing to do and how it may impact your community or even your own um, um, property. Can you go back one, please? On behalf of Florida's Turnpike, I thank you again for your interest in this project and have a good evening. <laughs>